Yeah, so I want to give some notes on Ethereum's circulating supply equilibrium and the prospect of minimum viable issues under proof of stake. So the economics of Ethereum is in profound transformation. We're currently moving to proof of stake, which will happen with the merge, that leads to a new issuance policy. And issuance uh, within this pol policy uh, is inflation by issuing tokens to stakers that validate the chain. And this inflation is counteracted by deflation through Ethereum in proof of 1559, where we burn transaction fees. And this, this was adopted last year. So these two counteracting forces are going to lead to a circulating supply equilibrium. An economic equilibrium occurs when the study variables will not change in the absence of external influence. So it's sort of a resting state. A classic example is the you know, supply and demand. That can be studied, studied as a partial equilibrium, or it can be studied as a general equilibrium. <clears throat> Two important concepts I want to bring up uh, is, uh, from finance is one is the time value of money. The idea that uh, we would rather prefer to receive a sum of money now instead of the same sum of money later it sort of reflects the, the earnings potential of invested money. So if, uh, if a cryptocurrency is held as an investment, market forces dictate that uh, the investors would expect you know, a return on their investment. On the other hand, we have demand for money. People may want to hold money in order to be able to transact with it. So we have sort of the transaction motive behind the demand for money. And so that's an, another side of the coin, you know. And so my point today is going to be to describe the equilibrium, reason about economic variables, and Ethereum's issuance policy. So let's look at current statistics. Uh, currently, there's a circulating supply of around 118.6 million ETH. And so, uh, as the end of March. And the yearly burn ether is around 3.14 million ETH. If we go by, as the end of March, the average of 8,600 ETH burn per day. This gives us a burn rate of around 2.65%. The lowest months have been around 1.2%. The highest months have been around 4%. Something like that. And the burn rate here, it, you know, it's, it's not just a number. The burn rate represents something. Uh, and one way to frame it is to say that um, it represents the amount of ether that we want to hold in relation to how much we want to spend on transaction each year. Or, for example, how highly we value the ether token in relation to the utility of the chain that we wish to pay for. You could also frame it as the revenue of the network. And since this revenue is distributed to the token holders, uh, what you get is a situation where people could buy the token to sort of take, take, take in that revenue. So, so the price of the token would like to be affected, you know, about uh, by how much revenue that comes in. And one way to frame it is sort of like this. If you... If people decide tomorrow that they don't really want to transact as much on Ethereum, so, so, say in fiat terms, the, the daily transaction fees goes from, say, $30 million to $3 million, a reduction of 10x. You'd sort of expect that the token price would fall as well. So, in a way, that would compensate, and you could still use the burn rate in your models. Because if the token price falls when people don't use the, the chain for trans transacting as much, you'd, you'd retain sort of the same, same burn rate. <clears throat> so this becomes then a way when we model Ethereum to abstract away future unknowns. We're not gonna, we can't know what the price of uh, a to the Ether token is going to be like 30 years from now. The market cap of the chain, how many transactions we can fit into a block or you know, the demand for block space across L1 or L2. So we don't know these variables and we don't know exactly how all the scaling solutions are going to work out in the future. So the point is then, that we rely a little bit on the time value of money by using the burn rate in our models. And we say that, okay, we think that the market cap probably is going to be reflected in yearly burn transaction fees. And of course, you have to start with revenue. You can't start with issuance because issuance has to come from somewhere. And if it doesn't come from revenue, then, of course, 
uh, issuance just dilutes token holders. <clears throat> so let's look at issuance in proof of stake Ethereum. We have the, the, the yearly issuance as C times S times the square root of D. C here is a constant, uh, <clears throat> representing the number of epochs uh, per year uh, and compensated for the fact that the protocol denominates Ether in GUI. It's currently around 2.6. And the base reward factor is 64 and is set by the developers. And the deposit size is around 11 million ETH as of the end of March. And so we can compute uh, the yield issues from this equation and we get 552,000 ETH as yield issues. Another important thing to keep in mind is the deposit ratio, the proportion of ether that is currently staked. Deposit size divided by the circulating supply. And this variable ha has importance with regards to the security of the chain. And now we can uh, use that variable to compute a compact uh, representation of the issuance rate. So the issuance rate is the yield issuance divided by the circulating supply. It's currently around 0.5%, so much lower than the burn rate currently. And still we can ensure security. And that's why we will have a circulating supply of equilibrium. Because issuance rate is going to rise with the falling circulating supply, as I will show later. And so uh, we can insert the yearly issuance uh, equation into the issuance rate here. And then we can say that the deposit size equals deposit ratio times the circulating supply. Switching these variables, uh, breaking out S, and we have a more compact representation for the issuance rate. And say that the deposit ratio is 0 0.5, half of the ether is staked. Then we can plot the issuance rate across the circulating supply. And you see the issuance rate rises when the circuit circulating supply goes down. And the burn rate on the other hand is not gonna depend on the circulating supply. You know, the burn rate, you, you, don't, you don't care about the denomination of a token when you decide if you wanna pay for a transaction or not. And so you can compute the circulating supply equilibrium at the point where these lines cross. And we will go, into a little bit more details about this graphical representation, but now I want to look at the circulating supply equilibrium. So given our equation for yearly burn and yearly issuance, we can set up the equality when yearly burn equals yearly issuance. Insert the equations and break out S, and we get the circulating supply, and it's the constant C times the base root factor uh, times uh, the square root of D divided by the burn rate. And so we can plot this. And here we have a deposit size on the y-axis and we have the burn rate on the x-axis. And, um, and so each little color here represents a different circulating supply. <clears throat> and so you can see, for example, there's, there's a little bit, bit of an issue though, because in this bottom right corner here, the burn rate is gonna be higher than, the, the yearly burn is gonna be higher than the yearly issuance even at 100% staking. So we set up that equation, and we say that even at 100% staking, the yearly burn is higher than yearly issue, so we don't have an equilibrium. This is a disequilibrium in the, in the bottom right corner here. And so we can insert D into this equation, and, and, and we can break out D. And so, the equilibrium is reached. The, we, we move away from this equilibrium uh, when, when D falls so that both sides are equal. And that point is also, of course, the circulating supply equilibrium. So this was just a way to correct the graph. So now you can say you can take a point here in this area, and you say to find the correct circulating supply equilibrium, you have to traverse the graph vertically up to you know, the point of that line there. And that's mostly more of an academic exercise. I wanted to get, you know, the whole graph correct. Of more importance, however, is the yield at which staking demand stabilize. So we're talking now about sort of the marginal yield. If the yield would be higher, then more people will stake. If the yield will be lower, 
the less people will stake. So, so the yield is going to stabilize, you know, at some, some specific uh, deposit charge. <coughs> and you can also um, describe issuance as a yield times the deposit size. So you can set the equality between these two uh, equations for issuance, and, and from that de derive how the deposit size depends on the yield, and how the yield de depends on the deposit size. So now I'll plot the yield on the right side of this uh, y-axis. And we see the yield varies with the deposit size. And so um, we can say that, okay, we think that people are going to demand 3% yield. That's where it's going to stabilize. And we think that the burn rate is going to be like it is today, say 2.5%. And then we can derive what the circulating supply equilibrium will be at that point. So in this case, it would be 37 million ETH. Probably it's going to be a little bit higher, but we'll see later. But you know, that's, uh, that's the principle of this, what we're trying to do here. Complicating things is the simplified active validator cap and rotation proposal. Uh, the idea that we want to you know, cap the number of active validators so that the hardware requirements are capped for those that validate. And so uh, Vitalik proposed 2 to the power of 19 validators. Perhaps there's going to be 2 to the power of 20 validators as discussion as well. And let's see what happens. If you set a cap at L validators, you get a yield issuance if the cap is reached of C times uh, F times the square root of 32 L. So, so, th so that caps the issuance, even if more de uh, ether is deposited. Uh, the, the issuance is not going to rise. We can use this to compute uh, the deposit size and how it depends on the yield as well. And let me now plot uh, the yield and how it varies there to the right. And you see here, if I go back and then go there again, you see that the yield uh, goes down at the same deposit size because the, the, the deposit eater has to share issuance from the cap. And so when you compute the circulating supply, the circ circulating supply can be found in this graphical representation at the cap. So you have the equation for circulating supply, you change it if you're beyond the cap. And so if you have a deposit size there, it's going to the circulating supply, the color is going to be found at the cap of the other representation. So that's how those two differ, you know, when you want to compute the circulating supply. And we can compute a number, of course. A high deposit structure implies that users prefer to stake the reader or be using it transacting on chain. The constrained burn rate can be defined as an attempt to account for this, removing the portion A of the deposited ether D from the circulating supply. So Previously, now, now we're entering into sort of the modeling world. We start thinking about how ex exactly our values are going to change, you know. And, and we say that, okay, we think that the real burn rate is going to vary uh, with the deposit ratio. Uh, because that's, that's how you can transform that equation. So the idea is that, okay, I can say, okay, I think that the constrained burn rate is going to be 2.5%. That is... Okay, now the deposit charge is very low, and okay, I say that okay, we, let's say that the constrained burn rate, let's say that the burn rate is 2.5 percent currently, but I acknowledge that as the deposit charge rises, people, when they stake their ether, they're not going to use it transacting on chain, so the deposit, uh, so the burn rate is likely to come down. So that's sort of the model here. <coughs> And so you can compute the uh, equilibrium using the same within this model with a constraint burn rate. And you can compute um, this issue in the bottom right corner as well. So here we see with a constrained burn rate model saying that, okay, actually, probably the burn rate is going to go down a little bit uh, when the deposit ratio rises. And then you get another circulating supply equilibrium. Trying to make the model more, you know, internally consistent, trying to say, you want to say sort of a burn rate that, that can adapt to the deposit ratio. 
And you can plot the same thing when you apply an active validator cap as well. The only difference here is that inactive validators will raise the equilibrium. Here I set alpha to 0 0.5. And inactive validators will raise the equilibrium when you, when you think that, that actually if more people deposit, even though they are not active as validators, they're still not going to transact, you know, on chain. Let's now go back uh, and have a closer look at the equilibrium, including in relation to the deposit ratio and the yield. So we have the equation for the issuance rate. And we can say that the deposit ratio is 0 0.5, half the, the ether is deposited. We can plot the relation, the issuance rate across the circulating supply. And as you recall, we can insert the burn rate into this equation as well. And what if the deposit ratio goes down? What happens to the issuance rate curve? Well then, it just, you know, goes lower. And if the deposit ratio rises to, to, to the maximum that it can be, then the issuance rate goes higher. And of course, the burn rate can be outside of this diagonal, but this diagonal is sort of, you know, an equilibrium diagonal, or sort of like a third dimension here. And so, so if the burn rate is, is outside of the di diagonal at a certain circulating supply, we say that eventually the circulating supply is going to converge into this diagonal. And that's where you're going to find, you know, the equilibrium. So here we have also, we can include the ranges from the previous graphical representations. Uh, and what I do, want to do now is, oh, and we can plot the circulating supply equilibrium, just a, 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 as an example. And now we can compute the yield at this circulating supply equilibrium, because I want to plot how the yield varies with the deposit ratio uh, and the circulating supply. So the yield at this yield can be computed as, as following, and you can swatch the deposit, deposit size to deposit ratio times the circulating supply. And so you can compute the yield at a specific circulating supply. And you can plot how, for example, a 5% yield will vary with deposit ratio uh, and circulating supply. And you can plot the different yield curves across deposit ratio and circulating supply. And the reason why I had such an uh, enormous range for this graphical representation is that I want to highlight the things that happens in the bottom right corner there. And I want to say, what if the deposit ratio is really low, say 7%, security is sort of uh, on the verge here, it's not very secure, and say that the yield has gone down very low, so if the yield goes down any further, then people are not willing to stake. Where can we find this condition? We can find this condition here. And uh, we can compute the issuance rate at that particular point because the issuance rate is a certain yield distributed across the deposit ratio. And the issuance rate is 0 0.0007. So if we say that, you know, the, the lowest deposit ratio we can accept is 7%, and we say that, oh, and the yield probably is going to be around 1% at that point, we can define sort of the point that is the lowest burn rate that can sustain a circulating supply equilibrium within the current issuance policy. So that's this point here. If the burn rate goes below that point, then over time, eventually, you'd reach this circle. And then people are gonna, uh, and then uh, the yield is gonna fall below and the deposit ratio is going to fall below, you know, that minimum acceptable deposit ratio. And the deposit ratio is going to be too low. And the only way to salvage this situation is going to be to raise the base reward factor. So then you have broken the equation for the circulating supply equilibrium. When you increase F, immediately the, the yield is going to go up. So people are going to deposit uh, uh, again. They're going to start, you know, staking again. But then, eventually, the circulating supply is going to rise, bringing down the yield until you reach the same point again. 
to say, for example, that we move, we increased the base wall factor by 20%. They say you just shift this diagonal. See how it moves? So what we're saying is you have to then increase the base wall factor all the time to retain a circulating supply equilibrium. <coughs> And, and so this gives sort of the range within which um, the, the current insurance policy can operate without eventually many hundreds of years from now, perhaps, or uh, hard to say, would have to raise the, the base world factor. And so that is if, if the, the burn rate falls by 30 to 40x, something like that. But of course, we are here now th at that point there. And we are moving in that direction, up there. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, um, it's not like this is any concern for us, but it's nice to have that, um, keep that in mind, you know. And so I only want to point out that, so that burn right there, that's the range for within which you'd have inflation or deflation. If the burn rate goes up above, you have deflation. If it goes below, you have deflation. And now I'd like to just plot the, that, that constrained Burnett model, the more sort of realistic model. And to do that, I insert, uh, I show the point where we have the current deposit Joshua at the burn rate. But the burn rate doesn't depend on the circulating supply. So in this case, don't focus on the circulating supply, only focus on how the burn rate varies with the deposit Joshua within this diagonal. And so here we have the equation for the burn rate. And so if we set alpha to 0 0.5, then you can see the burn rate would go down with, a, with, with an increase in deposit ratio. Something like that. Set alpha to 1. That means that the burn rate has to go to 0 if the deposit ratio goes to 1. And you may say, but what about the marginal yield? Wouldn't that vary with the deposit charge as well? And likely it would. It would be nice to have some sort of way to model that as well. Perhaps, you know, if the deposit charge is 0 0.95, then to convince, you know, those people that have, have the ether in a cold storage or, you know, the, the ETFs or whatever that has, you know, that lost proportion of ether, perhaps they would have to have an incredibly high yield to motivate them to also stake, you know. And on the other hand, if the, if the deposit loss is very low, there are going to be people that are dead set, you know, to stake at whatever, whatever yield, perhaps. And so perhaps it, it would look something like this. I plot here the, 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 the curve with the, with the odds function. Uh, so it would look something like this. You can specify like an adaptive yield, say that the yield is going to be 2%. I say that, I want to say, like, okay, I think the yield is going to be 2%. But I know that if the deposit charge is like 0 0.95, okay, okay, then the yield starts to go to infinity. And I know that if the deposit charge is very low, then okay, it's going to fall, you know. So, so we can use this, this, uh, this sort of model together with uh, the, the model for the, for the constraint burn rate to be able to just specify two variables and then have sort of an internally consistent way to see how they vary, you know, across the deposit charge. And so I can show here is where, where you have this sort of adaptive yield and how it changes with deposit charge. And here we can plot it across this diagonal. <clears throat> and so um, here we plot a constrained burn rate with alpha uh, 0 0.75 uh, and an adaptive yield set to 2% uh, with omega 0 0.5. And we can compute a circulating supply that is perhaps more realistic. At least somewhere here is probably where I'd put it right now, given the current situation. So you have a circulating supply of 70 million, perhaps. The burn rate goes down, perhaps drops by half. The post is 0.6, uh, and the yield is 2.5%. Perhaps something like this. I don't know, you know. Uh, there's going to be, there's still so much uncertainty here. We can't really, we can't really know where we are heading. And even if we reach some sort of circulating supply equilibrium, then you know that's going to vary across time as well going forward. 
Now I want to move on to the second part of this um, talk and talk a little bit more about issues policy. And I want to start that conversation by showing how the deposit ratio, the burn rate, and the yield relate to each other. You can set the quality at the equilibrium between yearly burn and yearly issues and compute a relationship between the deposit ratio, the burn rate, and the yield. And we can plot this relationship. And we see, I, 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 and so the colors here are different deposit ratios. And so uh, I, I have a white rectangle here that sort of represents where you'd expect, perhaps, that the burn rate and the, the yield would stabilize. We don't know, but some sort of, some sort of uh, idea. Uh, and then I plot a line that is 2 to the power of 19 validators, a deposit ratio of 0 0.14, and show that this line is below this rectangle, illustrating in one way that with sort of reasonable assumptions about the yield and the burn rate, you're going to have a higher deposit ratio. Because in this example I showed in the beginning, the deposit ratio was 0 0.83. <clears throat> for both models, if, it doesn't matter if you apply an active validator cap or not, uh, as I will show. And let's just have a look at the constrained burn rate as well. The same thing happens. So we can show here, here, here I compute for that, uh, um, the graphical representation I started with, and I compute the deposit ratio. You deposit ether, and you, you, you compute the circulated supply. And so you have deposit, no, deposit size divided by circulating supply and compute a deposit ratio. It's the same with there or without you have an active validated cap because the deposit ratio at the equilibrium is independent of, of the reward function, actually. And you can compute the same thing for the, for the constraint burn rate. <clears throat> and we'd had, have a policy of minimum vibrations during the proof of work here. Security of Ethereum will relate to the deposit ratio. If the deposit ratio is too low, then Ethereum starts to become insecure. But what is too low? Is 2 to the power of 19 validators sufficient? And is there too high? Is a deposit uh, ratio of 0 0.62 too high? Because perhaps if the deposit ratio is very high, Perhaps you reduce sort of economic activity. You open up a little bit for third-party rent-seeking. Because with a sustained burn rate, the issuance rate will rise and rise until it equals the burn ether. As shown, the deposit ratio is higher than this lowest deposit ratio that you could, uh, you could desire for reasonable Y and B. And so you start thinking, are other distribution models m more favorable? And so one option, of course, is to distribute the fraction of the burn for development or for public goods. You know, if the issuance rate rises and rises and rises to, to the burn rate, and we now burn 3 million ETH a year, and um, the price of the token is 3,000, then we're spending 10 billion on, on distributing to validators at the equilibrium eventually. And you know, Ethereum Foundation published their protocol. They had like their disclosure. They had like spent 50 million uh, last year on all development. So it's a fraction of a percentage point. On the other hand, public goods funding is really hard. You know, of course, it could be desirable to to develop Ethereum further with public goods, but it's really a can of worms. And I'm happy to not go into that discussion anymore here. Uh, instead. I'm going to focus on minimum viable issues. <clears throat> and I wrote this at ETH Research uh, last year when I started thinking about this, this stuff. Uh, if Ethereum attracts a high deposit ratio than what is strictly needed for security, would it serve the ecosystem better to slowly reduce yields to adjust the base reward factor, equally record rewarding all holders and participants in the ecosystem in the form of deflation? And how could this be enforced? And one idea was to have a gradual change of the base reward factor to retain a desirable deposit ratio. So if you, set, if you say, okay, I want the deposit ratio to be 0 0.25, and I believe that the yield is gonna be 2% at that point. 
then you can plot what the base reward factor would have to be within the current policy to achieve that sort of deposit ratio across the circulating supply. So it had to fall, you know, with the, rise, with the falling circulating supply. And in this, in this way, you'd, you'd be able to retain perpetual deflation. <clears throat> so let me give you an example. If the bar rate is 2%, the yield is 3%, and we are in a process of sustaining this perpetual deflation, we have a deposit judge to say this time we say 0 0.14, and that's where we want to keep it. That gives us a deflation of 1.6%. And say that we now go away from this and, and move back to the current policy. What would happen is that the circulating supply would be reduced, the, the deposit size would stay the same, reasonable assumption of what yields there, and the deposit ratio would increase at year one. On the other hand, with, by retaining the current policy, what you'd have to do is, you have to, when the circulating supply is reduced, you'd have to reduce the deposit size equally, and of course then, you'd have to adjust the base reward factor from this equation we had in the beginning. You'd have to focus on that one and, 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 and reduce the base reward factor so that you can reduce the deposit size, assuming that they want the same sort of yield. And so you'd have to take the square root there and you'd end up with something like that. So sort of the general idea here is to maintain the deposit ratio through a yield change of the base reward factor by the square root of one plus S. Or you can express it like this. So you target a specific uh, deposit ratio, then you see what is the deposit ratio right now, and how must we uh, change the base reward factor to go there. But in reality, of course, it's going to be much more complicated. Because there's, there's like, there are issues like discouragement of tax and the, you know, the natural variation in marginal yield that you could expect. So if you have this, this is the idea of the deposit ratio. And so you have this, and you have some sort of minimum viable issues. And you have some sort of active validator cap. And say like, um, actually the active validator cap is gonna you know, change as the circulating speed by falls in this case because we are plotting the relative stuff here, the deposit ratio. But let's focus here right now. And what, what's gonna happen if you try to target the minimum viable issues is that the deposit ratio is actually gonna move around anyway due to you know, natural variations in, in you know, the yield that people demand and you know, how the economy at large vary. <coughs> so you can't really keep it at a specific fixed point. Therefore, it's better to target some point above minimum variations to allow for these natural variations. And so you target some points, I uh, call it maximum viable deflation, that is above uh, minimum variations but below that desired active validator cap. So the idea is that we don't have to use the cap, we don't have to code all that stuff. And, and you know, adjust the strength based on how far away we are diverging. And so there will be some sort of similarities to you know, central banking targeting of 2% uh, inflation rate, but we target deflation instead and do it transparently and you know, with an algorithm. Uh, one issue is, the discouragement attack. Someone knows when you have a, a, a target, someone knows that they only have to stake half that target to take control of the chain. And so uh, that's why you want to keep the deposit structure pretty high, and there are other reasons as well. Uh, and um, however, if, if, if we go uh, for this new idea with the super committee instead of an active cap, where you randomly select like one million or two million validators each, uh, each time, then uh, you don't have to, you don't have this requirement to be within a, an active cap. And so you can be very slow to bring down the deposit ratio. If someone tries to attack it, they won't know that they immediately can, you know, get the 51%. They don't know like how much they, 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 they need to, to stake, to know. Another thing you can do is to guarantee a low minimum yield. And that's actually, I think it's, 
I mean, from an issuance policy perspective, that's pretty okay because we're in this relative domain here. Uh, say, for example, that you guarantee a 0.7% yield. Then even if the deposit charge rises to 67%, you know, uh, then the issuance rate would still be just, you know, at current levels. It would be perfectly fine. So, this was just my idea, trying to learn about the ecosystem and sort of looking at issuance policy and trying to model how, how things um, will relate to issuance policy. But, but let's look at the benefit of the current policy. Obviously, the current policy is accepted by the community and it has been through a long process, you know. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's simple, not only short term. A shrinking supply affects many variables. You'd have to change, you know, validator sizes, super committed sizes. Everything had to be relative instead of fixed. And with deflation from variable F, <coughs> it becomes harder and harder to estimate minimum variable issues. You know, coins can be lost, and so you don't know really what the deposit charge is of, you know, active tokens. And maybe 200 years later, those coins show up. And now the deflation has turned the circling supply so low that someone, someone can gain a very large proportion of the, the ether, like many hundred years from now, from, from pure luck or something like that. And you could also argue that if you have a perpetual deflation, uh, the, the circling supply goes down and down and down in infinity. It would be too good for non participant entities. But let's show some benefits as well. And so one benefit you could, uh, you could say is that if pushes uses into a more complex monolego, the current policy, such as staking derivatives, because with the current policy, you'd have to have, you know, um, <clears throat> you have to, at the circulating supply equilibrium, all the, the rewards that come in, all the, all the revenue will be distributed to those that stake. No revenue will be distributed to token holders. That's not the case currently. Currently we are in deflation towards an equilibrium. So the revenue is distributed to token holders via deflation. But at the equilibrium that would longer be the case. So you'd sort of expect people to want to hold you know, the, the staking derivatives instead of the ether token within the normal economy when they do normal stuff, you know. And so these staking derivative providers will, will gain more and more power over the chain. And you know, there's a risk for third party rent seeking there that have, have some sort of power to extract rent from the people that use their staking derivatives. And they'd still be sort of satisfied with that because that's better than holding the token, you know. Perhaps that poses risk. And even if it doesn't pro pro pose risk to the consensus, you know, it, it would pose risks to the financial ecosystem, perhaps. Because this taking derivatives integrates within the ecosystem and within the modern diagram. Deflation also enables non-state ether to excel at two money functions. As a store of value, you'd expect the token price to go up much more because you are re reducing the circulating supply, so keeping the market cap fixed, that would, that would happen. And as a medium ex of exchange, you'd expect you know, the shelling point of the ether token to, to become stronger if, if people don't use the staking derivatives as, as the, if that don't, doesn't become you know, the shelling point. But however, it would be a worse unit of account because the token price would go up more. And so you couldn't pay with, with goods in, in a store in the same way because the, the in each denominated prices for, for the goods would go down over time. You'd expect more. But perhaps that's not an issue. Perhaps we are, we are not pricing goods in a store in Ether token anyway. And the current policy would to a large extent centralize ownership into the hands of validators. That's not the case with the deflationary policy. Then you sort of minimize that issue. And you'd gain fairness as a competitive edge. There's no excess to validators. And so you can retain this variable F ultrasound meme long term. 
their, their token would always be deflationary. And because Ethereum is pr pr private money, so it's sort of a competitive market, someone else could come along. You know? And variable F removes the need for an active validator cap, and it protects the below minimum violations. You know that super low point I showed where the burnout is really low and that you have to sort of convene to decide to raise the base reward factor anyway. Now we're protected against that, so that's nice little extra perk. But, so I described the equilibrium and reasons a little bit about economic variables and Ethereum's issuance policy. There's no, I'm not even sure myself what I think is the best issuance policy. By no means am I sort of thinking that a variable F is, is, is the best thing. I'm, sort of here trying to learn, you know, about what, what would be the best. And I think that when you describe, describe, you know, how the variables interact with each other, you can get a lot of new ideas, you know. That's, that's what I, I was hoping to bring here, to get like an understanding of what the, what the economics of Ethereum looks like currently. So uh, that was all for me. Thank you, and uh, we have a couple of minutes for some questions, if there is any. There's one over there. Yeah, so I wonder, uh, wait a minute, let me give you the microphone. I wonder, everything that you've sort of uh, modeled here seems to re rely on the base fee as the only reward that the validators are receiving. But in reality, once we move to proof of stake, we know that there'll also be a significant tip component, which I understand will be much more difficult to both val uh, sort of you know, value or moderate. But I wonder that, you know, itself will increase the um, rewards and incentives to staking. So I wonder if that sort of impacts your analysis. Well, yeah, the priority fee and MEV we're talking about here, right? Yeah. 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 yeah so this um, pushes down the yield that, that someone actually require to be willing to, to stake the tokens. And so that changes uh, the, the equations a little bit. I have equations for that as well. I didn't include them here. but, but uh, one thing I'd like to mention there, because then um, I try to make models that include these things. And, and one thing I try to do with these models is to, to assume that, uh, to sort of include them within the models. One assumption that I try to make is that to say that the MEV is going to vary with economic activity. And to say that the burn rate sort of is, represents economic activity. Uh, and so what, you, what, what happens then if you want to, want, to, want to model MEV is because you can see that if you see the, the, the weeks that the Flashbot reports having the highest MEV has also been the weeks that we had the highest burn rate. And so I try to, to I include that. And, and you end up with something like, um, if you look at it, you end up with something like, um, what is it? Sort of like zero point, if you, if you add the MEV and the, and the tips, you, you end up with something like 0 0.2 ETH per block. That is, that is like the reward that they receive as well. Um, and so that complicates the equation a, a little bit, but, but it doesn't really change things all that much. It changes things a little bit, but it doesn't really disrupt anything if you assume that they're gonna vary with the burn rate. But, but it's important to include as well, and, I, and I'm gonna include this uh, in the equations going forward, yeah. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause to Anders. That was a great talk. Thanks.